What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pixel Therapy channel, the home of great games and even better vibes. As you can clearly tell from the title, this video is about the motion rig that I built over the course of a week and a half. Um, the build was a fairly simple build, uh, and the reason it took a week and a half mo was mostly due to the fact that I, had, um, I hadn't ordered enough hardware to actually combine the Simblax uh, cockpit and the PT actuator actuators together. So there was a period of about three days on which I was waiting for extra uh, T-nuts and the bolts to attach the two together. Now the video itself, the reason I'm doing this video is mostly for two main reasons. The first one is to actually just share the build process with you. And so you're actually going to watch a series of videos that I filmed throughout that week and a half process when I was building the motion system. And I share my raw thoughts and sort of what I was thinking as I was building it. And I thought that would add some insight to the build process. The second reason why I'm doing this video is that I actually want to give my impressions on what I think about motion as a whole. Now, I've been using my motion system for about going on a week now. And you'll notice that uh, within the series of videos, there's even a 24 second little clip that I show with me driving in it. And I comment about that later in this video. So if you guys are interested in getting my first impressions and also just seeing the build process itself, uh, watch till the end of the video. And um, yeah, we can get into more detail and actually talk about it. The two products, like I said, that I used was a cockpit from Simblax. Now, Simblax is a New Zealand-based company, and they do uh, simulator cockpits, and they also sell things like direct drive wheels, load cell pedals, and all the other peripherals that come with sim racing. As for the actuators themselves, they came from PT Actuators, and I did an unboxing video, and I discussed about their product range when I did my uh, motion system buyer's guide. So essentially, it's bringing those two products together, and um, that was the build process. So I won't ramble on too much in this intro. Check out the videos, and then I'll be back to give you guys my impressions on motion in general and what I actually thought about this build process. Cheers. So today's a good day. It's an exciting day. It is the first part of my motion actuator build. And so what I'll be doing is doing a series of these small vlogs, uh, parts one till, till it's done. And uh, I'll be going through sort of like the build process, what I need to do, what I'm doing, um, and just kind of any issues that I come across or anything that I notice or maybe any pointers, um, I'll let you guys know. So with that being said, let's sort of uh, get into part one of this build and uh, I'll discuss sort of the game plan or what it looks like at this point in time. Now, um, here we go. So essentially, we're going to take that motion system and put it on a rig. Now, the current situation is it's sitting in a box over there, as you can see, and this is sort of the space that we have to work with. So I guess this is a behind the scenes or sort of way I do my recording and stuff. So my current rig, as you can tell, is a K2 cockpit rig over here with a direct drive on it. We've got some Usingfeld Pro pedals, so not the Sprint, the Pros, the older ones. We've got our PC, that's a flight stick. So this has been replaced with an AT20 rig. And on the way, we've got an ultra wide with a webcam and just small, just a small screen in there for the OBS. So essentially what uh, we're planning on doing is we're gonna have to take all of this apart pretty much. And as you can tell, there's sort of like limited room in this space. It's not a very big space at all. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is actually moving across town to a slightly different location where there is more space and um, we can start the build. So step one is to tear all of this off and then we're going to go to the next space. I'm going to show you all the boxes for the 8020. We're going to look at it unboxed, slowly put it together, and then see how we can go. So, um, yeah, this is the before. Um, I guess we'll slowly work through until we get to the after. Thank you very much for that. Cheers. Hello, everybody. Now, welcome back to the space. Um, so, essentially, we're moving from the original space that I've just showed you 
to a slightly different environment and I have some of the stuff laid out that we're going to be using. So I will just uh, show you guys what it looks like. Right, so I've got all the motion actuator bits laid out on the table here. Excuse the refreshments. And so we have the actuators over there with the control box here. We've got some tools and then we've got a Simplex uh, 8020 cockpit. So the plan is to put the base together initially. Then I'm going to attach the actuators. And then after that, we will see if we can fit the Sparkle seat onto there as well. At that point, I think we will try and mount the direct driver in the front mount and then take some measurements and see if we can make this thing ergonomic. So yeah, I'll get back with when we move from that step. Cheers. Right guys, an update with the build. So I've put together the base and essentially I'm going to hold fire here. So rather than put the seat on, what I will do is start working on the actual actuators. So we've got them out of the back and then in this sort of like bracket sort of thing. So I'm going to put all of these together because I figure it'll be a lot easier for me to attach the actuators to the actual uh, 8020 frame without the seat and all the other bits on it because it'll be lighter and easier to sort of rotate and turn around. So that's where we're at. And um, yeah, the next time I see you guys, hopefully we should have four actuator legs on there. Cheers. Peace. See you soon. Right. So right now, this is what we have going on. So essentially, I used some of these T-nuts, which is essentially what they use. So with the Simblax uh, Sim Rig. Uh, you get these T-nuts, and this is sort of the T-nut slot that goes inside the extrusion. And then you get these on top to put it together. So what that joint looks like is something like that. So the T-nut slot goes in there, and then you get the little bolt that comes on top there. So I used a few of these along the profile to connect this bracing here onto the... Uh, onto the frame. So eight on each side, eight for each actuator times four. So that's about 32. So I'm 32 short in there, which I need to order again. These ones here, which are the more standard slots that we're all used to or we've seen, they tend to go onto the other parts of the profile that have to do with the um, direct drive mount and just the side panels and the monitor mount and what have you. So this is where we're at. So while I wait for the hardware to come, I think I'm going to hook this up to the control box over here. Excuse all the uh, plastic rubbish. I'm going to hook it up to the control box and I'm actually going to test the actuators because I haven't run them to test them to see if they are working and I've put them all together and nothing seems weird. So with no seats and wheels and pedals, this will probably be a good time to test it all. And then if it works, we will stick the seat on and then we'll do the monitor mount and see how we go. So yeah, that's it for day two of the build. Cheers, thanks for watching. Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is day three of the actuator build. Now what I've done is I have connected all the PT actuators, actual actuators to the rig. I think you saw that yesterday. And currently what I'm doing now is I am double checking the servo drivers to ensure that the parameters are correct. So when these come from the factory, they will be one parameter that you need to check, which is your mortar RPM limit. By default at the factory, it's set at 5,000. You need to drop it down to 3,000. So I'm going to show you guys quickly uh, what that looks like. Right. So these are the parameters that you are meant to have on your servo. 
these parameters, as you can tell, I've gotten them off Barry's uh, PT actuator build. So this would be part two where he does his electronic and wiring. And this one right here, parameter 51, it's meant to be 3000. When you get it on your servo drivers, it will be 5000. So you have to go in there and update that. So generally, once you've got your servos hooked up, this is what it looks like. And to update it, you push this mode button right here to go to parameter. Then you go down to parameter 51. So in this case, you press that to go across. You drop that to 51. You press and you hold that. And there you go, it is 3,000. So I've updated mine. So when you do this, you will find yours at 5,000. You just push mode a few times across to get to the respective number. And then you can drop it down or bring it back up. And then you press and hold to lock it in. And that's how you do it. So essentially, that's where we're at. So we have put in a plug. So when the actuators come, they will not have a plug. You have to fit in your own plug. And then you take off the case with just some Allen bolts and basically do this, check all your servo drivers, check the parameters, and uh, yeah, we'll be on to the next step of testing. Cheers. So as you can see, that's the original seat that we purchased. Um, it was pretty narrow within there and there. So for me, it's a bucket seat and it's meant to fit tight, so that's okay. But uh, a lot of people will be using this simulator, so we needed something wider. So we went from that bucket seat to a more open seat, which is also Sparkle branded. Um, and then as you can see, if we pull back, uh, we've got the actuators attached, the pedals have been attached, uh, the steering wheel is on, and the monitor mount is on. So we're going to fit the monitor on there. So let's just actually test this out and have a look at everything in motion. Oh, give me a second. So, this should be raising up now. That's not bad. And then we come over here and we sort of look at the clearance of the monitor mount. So that's the highest it'll go, which is bad. And then lift. Okay. So these are sort of the things that I have to check out and make sure that the clearance isn't too bad. Just make sure I step over everything. So yeah, that's where we're at. And that's what it looks like so far. Sweet. And welcome back. So let's get straight into it. Let's talk about motion systems as a whole. And then let's talk about my experience with motion systems. So I clearly, it took me about a week to build the simulator. And if you notice at the end of the build video, there was a 24 second clip that I showed of me testing the motion simulator for the first time. You'll notice in this clip, what I did was this was this motion simulator straight out of the box. So I hadn't set any spike filters that stop out that stop any in, insane fluctuations in motion. I didn't uh, tune it to the sim, and I put on a rally sim, which is probably the most aggressive motion you're going to get. You will notice in the clip you heard a lot of squeaking. Most of that actually came from my throttle pedal, which needs to be oiled, and the clacking came from my shifter pedals. 
But the motion sim itself, except for the big jumps that you hear in between that 24 second video, it is, relev it is relatively quiet. Um, the space that I moved my motion to is actually from my old place, which is a small apartment building. And the reason I brought it here was I thought it was going to be noisy. But once I've dialed it in from that initial video throughout the course of a week and a half, it really isn't that noisy. In fact, my girlfriend actually was surprised at how quiet it is. So I think that was the first thing. So what were my first impressions when I actually did my first drive? Well, I guess motion is a bit like VR when you try it for the first time. You fall into one of two camps, really. You get the people who try VR for the first time, and it's amazing. It blows their socks off, and they're, they're in. They're, they're, they're into it. Then you get the majority of the people who fall into the second camp. And these are the people who... When they try VR for the first time, it's a bit overwhelming. It's a lot of messages coming that they're receiving that they're not used to. And it can either make them sick or it's just discomfort. It's, it's uncomfortable to begin with. And I think I fell into the second camp, to be honest with you guys. When I first tried it, especially in that 24 second clip, I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, I get it. My, my, my body's moving. It's being thrown around. But there was no connection between driving and that. It literally felt like, I don't know, like I, I, I was more a passenger rather than the driver. That I was being taken for this roller coaster ride while I was trying to do something else, which is actually drive my simulator. But what I did was, I went through a process where I turned everything down. Like all the way down to zero. And then I slowly started putting the sliders up, sim by sim. And doing it that way. And I noticed that it changed everything. Motion became a game changer in that sense. And I'll show you what I mean. So what motion does is it has, like VR, it has the ability to immerse you deeply into the simulation that you're playing and actually potentially change the way you view that simulation. So kind of like... For those of you who have a direct drive wheel, if you think the very first time you used your direct drive wheel from a belt driven wheel, you could tell that there was potential there, but it wasn't dialed in. And it wasn't until you actually dialed in your direct drive wheel to the sim to be able to give you the information from the sim that you found useful in your driving skills that it really began to shine and it changed the sim uh, for, for a lot of simulators. That's what direct drive wheels tend to do. And motion is exactly the same as that. Once you dial in your motion and you're able to pull out the information from the simulator, it changes the sim completely and it enhances the driving experience. So, for example, in my case, the, the, the sensations that I would say stuck out with me were the sway, which is the almost like the G-force sensation. So it's not the traction loss so much, but that G-force push that you feel. And in a motion simulator, it's a combination of roll and pitch that kind of gives you that sway sensation. And it, for me, it was the, the surge motion moving forward during braking. The heave was there for like the rumble strips and all that kind of stuff. That was fun. But it was mostly the sway and the surge that really stuck out to me as something that I could, information I could use to improve my driving skill. So the sensation, I guess, the way I could describe it is like, imagine you're sitting on a chair, a chair with four individual legs, right? And you're kicking off on that chair and sort of swinging back on the two back legs. And you kick and you swing off and you kick and you swing off. Your inner ear gets the sensation of balance. And you know exactly how hard to kick off before you get to a point of no return and fall all the way backwards. And that's exactly what that sway and that G-force gives you when you're turning your wheel into a corner or mid-corner. Is with each sim, you very quickly realize how much of that sensation you can take for a specific corner to corner before you actually lose traction and lose the car. So for a sim like, say, for example, iRacing, which tends to reward you if you drive a little under the limit, because once you go over, there generally isn't a point of no return. I found that when I dialed it in with my motion system, I was more driving on the limit. Or I had the confidence to really drive on the limit. 
as in I now knew after a few laps of practice how hard I could push it based on my speed and balance it because the motion system would balance and that sensation gave me that inner ear sensation of almost trying to balance a chair on the hind legs. With the braking, each time I hit the brake, the surge would tip and push me forward. And I knew based on the sensation that I was feeling that I've probably pushed the brake at 20%, 50%, 75%. At this point, I'm probably going to be locking up. And so once you do your practice, it gives you these extra cues that you use into your driving that you build confidence and you start to push the car more. So... One of the questions that gets asked about motion is, does it make you slower? The answer to that question is, it depends. If, like with a direct drive wheel, you're going for 100% force feedback and you're just cranking everything to an 11, chances are you're not going to be as fast as anybody else. Same thing with motion. If you do that and you crank these things all the way up, they will rattle you that you won't even be able to keep your brake consistently because you'll be fluctuating and you're not going to be fast. However, if you dial it all the way back and you pull that information in, the answer is no, it doesn't make you slower. I wasn't slower. Once I dialed it in, I was back to my normal lap times within two hours of every sim that I set. I definitely wasn't slower. I was enjoying it a lot more and it was more immersive, but I wasn't slower. Does motion make you faster? Not necessarily. You see, it gives you information much like a direct drive wheel, but we all know that the key to speed is things like your brake points, your entry into corners, your getting good exits out of corners, uh, controlling the car on the limit, uh, getting a nice um, slip angle when you're taking turns. Those are the fundamentals to driving quickly. And those, the sim will give you information either through your direct drive and through your motion but if you don't have the technique to use that information to execute those skills you're not going to be faster so motion doesn't make you faster but it doesn't make you slower motion does give you the information however just like a direct drive wheel that if you want to learn to be faster it potentially could help you because you can get more information if it is dialed in. So I think generally the question now is, is motion worth the $3,000, $4,000, $6,000 that you're probably going to be paying for for a four actuator motion system like I have? Uh, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first thing that I buy. Um, I would probably spend the money on load cell pedals first. I would spend the money on a good cockpit. You need a good cockpit anyways to have motion. And a direct drive wheel. I find that the strength you get in a direct drive wheel when you're turning it is useful when you have motion because these machines are heavy. Your body weight is heavy. So when that sway is coming in, the sensation is quite strong. And playing that off the strength of a direct drive wheel feels amazing. The instances where I had my direct drive wheel on a lighter force feedback, and I'm not talking about like crazy heavy, generally anywhere between 10 to about 12 Newton meters is the sensation, is the way you generally want it. Uh, so a little above the CSL uh, and Finitech wheelbases, which are about 8 Newton meters. You want about, yeah, 9 to 12, give or take. But yes, when you move it, you feel connected with that sway going from side to side. So I would say, yes, definitely get your load cell pedals first, get your co cockpit first, get your um, direct drive wheel first. If you still have the money and you're still interested especially with the way motion is coming down in price and the numerous manufacturers coming out, yes, it is worth it, 100%. I mean, I did a motion buyer's guide a few months ago. Check that out on the channel if you'd like. And yeah, anywhere from $700 with the DOF reality, you've got the PT actuator from three to $4,000. Since I did that video, two new companies have come out that do motion systems. You've got the Cubic System. I haven't done this. And um, something like System Integrally along those lines. 
I'll, I'll put like a link to the all the motion companies downstairs and you can have a look at them. But yes, it is definitely, yeah, if you have the money and you've got the rest of the equipment, 100% motion is worth it. So that's my first impressions of motion systems. Um, what I will be doing is I will actually be doing tuning guides for every single sim. Now, the software that I use for tuning is called uh, Sim Race Studio. And so if you have a Pro Simu motion system, if you have an FF SFX 100 or 150 DIY motion system, and if you have a PT actuator motion system, then you will find these videos useful. As well as um, if you are using a Thanos controller board and that sort of stuff, we'll dive back into that as well. Um, so yes, subscribe if you want to see those videos, if you want to see the tuning videos. I'll also be doing videos based on which sim provides the best um, telemetry and motion sensations as well as to what sims you want to try out. And believe you me, the feeling in certain sims changes. Motion does change the way you perceive a sim. Um, it, 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 a hundred percent changes the immersion, not necessarily the physics of the sim, but the immersion and adding that extra detail of information. Yes, it is a game changer. I 100% recommend it if you have the money and if you've got all the other equipment that are necessary to being fast and enjoying sim racing. So that's basically my video. Thank you very much for spending time and checking it out. If you guys like the channel, please like, subscribe. And also, I have a Sim Racing GP uh, racing community where we race race room, where we race ACC, AC, and AMS2 once it becomes on board, iRacing as well. So if you guys are into that and you want to just jump in, do some community races, I have a Discord that's linked below, and my Sim Racing GP is linked below as well. So just uh, jump in, say hi, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys on track. But uh, thanks again and have a good one. Peace.